Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. Will 2024 bring another war between America and Yemen? The attacks have been on. The impact on global trade is immense. A lot of firepower has been deployed in the region. We've been telling you all about it. Tonight, let's tell you about who these fighters are. Who are the Houthis? Who leads them? Why are they fighting? And can Iran really rein them in? Tonight, we'll answer all these questions and more. Meanwhile, Iran has attacked targets in two countries. Iraq and Syria, they say they've bombed Mossad headquarters. We'll tell you all about it. And this happened while India's Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar was in Tehran. The Iranian regime wants compensation from India. We'll explain. In Europe, the growth engine Germany is suffering from a case of long COVID. The economy is shrinking. In Asia, the two giants are fighting a toy war. India versus China as global toy manufacturers are dumping the dragon. India is also grappling with aviation chaos. The regulators have issued new guidelines. We'll tell you what to expect the next time you take a flight. How Turkey is emerging as a dark horse in Africa. What India can learn from the success of tennis player Sumit, Sumit Nagal. How Donald Trump won Iowa. And why Vivek Ramaswamy is out of the presidential race. Also, will a salary hike make you happy? We'll discuss the headlines first. Boris Johnson joins rebellion against Rishi Sunak over his Rwanda bill. It comes as the UK Prime Minister faces a crunch vote on the policy. Sunak wants to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to Rwanda, but the plan has divided his party. In 2022, it was Boris Johnson who had announced the Rwanda policy. India signs a lithium mining deal with Argentina, the first such overseas deal. New Delhi has bought exploration and production rights to lithium blocks in Argentina. The move will reduce dependency on China. Lithium is used in batteries for electric vehicles. Tanzania withdraws approval for Kenya Airways flights, says it is in retaliation after Kenya denied rights to Air Tanzania. Kenya Airways is one of Africa's largest airlines. Tanzania, with over a million tourists every year, is one of its biggest markets. Births in France in, in 2023 fell to their lowest since World War II. Around 678,000 babies were born last year, dropping by 6.6% from 2022. The previous lowest number, number of births was in 1946, after the Second World War. Uniqlo sues its Chinese rival Shein. The Japanese fashion giant is taking Shein to court for copying its popular bag, dubbed the Mary Poppins Carry All. It is reportedly Uniqlo's best selling bag ever. And a New Zealand MP quits over shoplifting allegations. The Green Party leader cited mental health issues and work stress for her actions. Gloritz Garaman was the first refugee to be elected to New Zealand's parliament. In the Red Sea, attacks continue. The Houthis have struck a U.S.-owned vessel. It's called Gibraltar Eagle. Damages are low, but the message is clear. The Houthis will not stop, not unless Israel stops the war in Gaza. We've discussed the Red Sea in detail in the past few days. We've mentioned what's at stake. But tonight, we're focusing on the Houthis. Who are they, who leads them, and how, they're taking on, how are they taking on the U.S. military? We'll answer the who first. Houthis are a Shia armed group in Yemen. It's hard to put a date on their founding, but most accounts say the 1990s, that's when the Houthis came into being. Their real name is different though. It's not Houthis. It's Ansar Allah, meaning partisans or supporters of God. Their identity is crucial to their story. We know Shias are a minority in the Muslim world, but within Shias, there is another minority, the Zaydis. And the Houthis belong to that sect. They fight for and represent the Zaydis. But why fight at all? Let's take you back to Yemen, the Yemen of the 1990s. It was ruled by this man, Ali Abdullah Saleh. He was a soldier turned strongman. And his special skill? Corruption. Saleh ruled Yemen 
for more than three decades. And in this time, he made more than $30 billion. It tells you how corrupt he was. So Zaydis revolted against him. They accused Saleh of stealing from poor Arabs. That's one reason why they're fighting. Another reason is religion. Through the 1980s and 90s, Wahhabism spread through Yemen. Now, Wahhabism is an Islamic school of thought. It's part of Sunni Islam. And this spooked the Shia Zaydis. They thought the Wahhabis would wipe them out, that their sect would soon disappear. So what did they do? First, they formed a politi political party, the Al-Haq Party. And among its leaders was this man, Hussein Badr al-Din al-Houthi. In 1997, he built a network for Zaydi youngsters. He called it Believing Youth. The mission was religious education, and social welfare. But soon that changed. In the 2000s, Abdullah Saleh aligned with America. He supported Washington's war on terror, even the invasion of Iraq. He supported all of it. And in return, he got plenty of aid money from the US. So the Zaydis were livid. Most of their youth had been radicalized. Their new slogan was death to America, death to Israel. So now Saleh cracked down. He launched military campaigns against the Zaydis. In 2004, Hussein al-Houthi was killed in one such strike. So the leader was dead, but his name remained. The Zaydi fighters soon came to be called Houthis. Their base is in northern Yemen. As a result, they often clashed with Saudi Arabia as well. In fact, Riyadh joined Saleh's crackdown. Together, they hunted Houthi fighters. But they could not win. Then came the Arab Spring in 2011. The Houthis eagerly joined the protests in Yemen. They managed to topple Abdullah Saleh. But you won't guess what happened next. In 2014, the allegiance shifted. Saleh's successor became a Houthi Yem enemy. So Saleh and Houthis joined hands, and together they waged a civil war. In 2015, Yemen's capital, Sana'a, fell to the Houthis. They soon declared allegiance to Iran. Tehran gives them cheap oil, funds, and weapons. In return, the Houthis irritate Saudi Arabia. That's the strategic equation at play. Of course, there is a Shia connection as well. Iran is the biggest Shia power in the world. The Houthis are a Shia armed group. It's a match made in heaven. Today, the Houthis control most of Yemen. They're led by this man, Abdul Malik al Houthi. Now, very little is known about him. He's around 40 years old, never stays in one place, never faces the media, and rarely meets foreign officials. Abdul al Houthi is the brother of Hussein al Houthi. At first, he was a battlefield commander, but after his brother's death, he took charge. And under him, the Houthis are more daring. They were tagged sites in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and now they're taking on the US. But here's the million dollar question, what do they want? Right now, they want Israel to stop the war. But the bigger goal is this, to protect Zaydi interests in Yemen, to rule the entire country, and to take on Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Can anyone stop them? Well, your best bet is Iran. The Houthis have declared common cause with Tehran. They also get weapons and oil from Iran. But how much leverage does Iran have? It's a complicated question. Iran says their support is only political, that the Houthis do not have Iranian weapons. But let's face it, that's highly unlikely. Houthi attacks require a level of intelligence and sophistication, the kind that Iran can give. At the same time, it's not a remote control relationship, meaning Iran may not command the Houthis. The leadership is different, the goals are different, and the area of operation is also different. It's not like Iran says stop and the Houthis will stop. It's a bit like the Taliban in Afghanistan. Many experts thought that Pakistan completely controlled the Taliban. But once they came to power, the equation changed. So my point is quite simple. Such relationships are very complicated. There are no rules here. Sometimes it's based on personal equations, sometimes on common enemies, and sometimes on religious ties. It's not a treaty alliance drafted by diplomats. Having said that, it may be the only option right now. Iran may not be able to control the Houthis, but at least they can talk to them. Well, that's the message from S.J. Shankar to the Indian External Affairs Minister. He was in Iran yesterday. He met with top officials and he raised the threat from the Houthis. We have even seen some attacks in the vicinity of India. This is a matter of grave concern to the international community. This fraud situation is not to the benefit of any party 
and this must be clearly recognized. He's talking about what happened last month. The ship bound for India was struck. The MV Chem Pluto targeted by a drone. There were no casualties. The US says Iran attacked it. India did not question Iran. India also did not contest America's claims. But it did vow to stop the attacks and punish the perpetrators. This was on the 24th of December. Almost one month has passed. That's enough time for India to reach its own conclusions about who the attackers were. India hasn't made it public, though. But it was brought up in Tehran. Reports say Minister Jay Shankar gave an assessment to the Iranians and later he spelled out India's position. India has a long standing and uncompromising position against terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. This remains. This remains so, very much so. No compromise on terrorism. That's the message from India. It sees these attacks as acts of terrorism. Jay Shankar told Iran that India expects a resolution. And did Iran agree? Well, not entirely. Both India and Iran want the conflict in Gaza to end. Both are wary of a wider regional conflict. But when it comes to the Red Sea crisis, Iran does not believe that the Houthis are responsible. They blame the West for it. America not it. America cannot stand by Israel with all its power and participate in the killing of 24,000 civilians in Gaza, including 1,000 women and more than 12,000 children, and at the same time invite others to exercise restraint, silence and non-action. So Iran and India are at odds, and the differences are not limited to the Red Sea tensions. Minister Jay Shankar met Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi and he spelled out his expectations from India, specifically on two issues, Israel's war in Gaza and India's investments in Iran. That's what Raisi highlighted. Let's take this one by one. When it comes to the war, Raisi thinks that India can play a greater role. He wants India to speak to Israel, to use its influence and to force them to end the bombings in Gaza. That is the expectation. And Tehran decided to make it public. The president's office released a statement. We have a copy. This is what it says. I'm quoting. It is important for India to play a role in ending the bombings, lifting the blockade of this region and realizing the rights of the Palestinian people. That's what Iran wants from India. Ask Israel to stop the war. Now let's tell you about the second demand. And this is related to the Chabahar port. President Raisi is not happy with the progress. He wants India to speed up the port's development and to compensate for the delays. He did not say what kind of compensation, though. But his choice of words conveys impatience. The true potential of Chabahar is yet to be realized. And what is Chabahar? It's a port in southeast Iran. India has been trying to develop it for years now, mainly as a gateway to Afghanistan to bypass Pakistan and reach Afghanistan. So Chabahar has immense strategic value. The first agreement was signed in the year 2003 between India and Iran. And in 2018, India took over the port's operations. But its capacity is limited and its expansion has been stalled, mostly because of American sanctions. In 2022, Iran sought a long-term commitment from India. They wanted a new agreement. The existing one, the current agreement, gives India the rights to operate the port for one year and these rights are renewed every year. What Iran wants is a new contract that is valid for 10 years and once it expires, it can be renewed automatically. The Iranian press says the talks have yielded a breakthrough. Both sides have reached a new deal, but the details are yet to be made public. Having said that, what is clear is that Iran wants speedy execution from India and this is a test for India's strategic autonomy. In 2022, India successfully navigated a challenging situation despite deep divisions, despite immense pressure. India balanced its ties with both Russia and the West. But with Iran, we've had limited success. From oil purchases to Chabahar, India has erred on the side of caution. So Raisi's demands present a challenge for New Delhi to secure an old friendship that has been under strain. And Iran was not just busy with diplomacy yesterday, its military was also active. Iran's Revolutionary Guard conducted an attack last night on two countries, Iraq and Syria.
Tehran fired missiles at both countries late last night. In Iraq, the target was Mossad, the Israeli spy agency. Mossad apparently has a headquarters in Iraq. Iran claims to have destroyed it. And in Syria, the target was a terrorist group, ISIS. ISIS attacked Iran earlier this month and Iran was out for revenge. Our next report has the details. Last night, Iran launched an attack. Multiple missiles were fired at Iraq and Syria. Iran says it had two targets, Israeli spies based in Iraq and the terror group ISIS based in Syria. Iranian state media actually broadcast the attacks, purportedly showing the missiles launch and when they hit their mark. In Iraq, the target was the city of Erbil. It's the capital of Iraq's Kurdistan region. Kurdistan is an autonomous region in Iraq, home to ethnic Kurdish people. Reports say that 6 to 10 missiles struck Erbil last night. Iran says it was aiming for Mossad, Israel's infamous spy agency. Iran says Mossad had an espionage headquarters in Erbil and they claim to have destroyed it. Israel has not commented on these Iranian claims, but some Kurdish locals have. We were sitting safely and peacefully in our house. Suddenly, around 11.10, we heard a big explosion, which caused glass shattering in all windows of this house. So, I came out and there were two other that hit the house in front of us. There was a family in that house, and I believe many of them were killed in the attack. The Prime Minister of Iraq's Kurdistan region has also spoken out. What's surprising, we are not a part of this conflict. We don't know why Iran is retaliating against civilians of Kurdistan, especially in Erbil. Uh, we have no animosity towards any of our neighbors, especially Iran. Uh, this has been uh, an, you know, another attack that uh, in, in the past few years, there have been other attacks also against Kurdistan. We don't know uh, what the reasons are, but all of the, all of the allegations that they have uh, made are baseless. Some reports say that an Iranian missile did hit an intelligence center, but it was apparently Kurdish, not Israeli. Both Iraqi and the local Kurdish authorities are outraged. They say Iran's strikes are a violation of Iraq's sovereignty. Iraq has recalled its ambassador from Tehran for consultations. They've also summoned Iran's chargé d'affaires in Baghdad. He was handed a letter of protest over the strikes. Relations between the two neighbours were bound to go downhill. But it could have been much worse, because the attacks took place near a US consulate in Erbil. The US has both a consulate and a military base in the city. So it's a risky place for Iran to attack. But no Americans were injured last night and no US buildings were damaged so Washington may not be forced to act. They have condemned Iran's strikes and call them reckless. But that seems to be all for now. However, this wasn't Iran's only attack last night. It also struck Syria. Here, Iran says it was targeting the terror group ISIS. This was a more straightforward affair. ISIS had attacked Iran on the 3rd of January. The terrorists set off two bombs in the city of Karman. They killed at least 84 Iranians who had gone to mourn at the grave of Iran's fallen general, Qasim Soleimani. So Iran wanted revenge on ISIS, and that's why it struck Syria. This is the result. Iran says its strike was successful, but here too, locals disagree. They say the Iranian missiles struck an abandoned medical clinic, and that no one was there when missiles hit. Syria and Iran are allies, the part of Syria Iran struck is controlled by rebels. Rebel groups who have been fighting the Syrian government for over a decade. They are regularly attacked by foreign nations and Syria doesn't lift a finger. Some of the rebel groups in Syria are Kurdish and they're regularly targeted, especially by Turkey. Ankara has been on the offensive against the Kurds for weeks in both Syria and Iraq. Iraq hasn't been saying much about the Turkish attacks and now Iran has attacked the Kurds too. The Kurdish people are under fire from both sides. Syria doesn't care. Iraq hasn't done enough to prevent this. Baghdad's reaction to the latest Iranian strikes may be encouraging. 
but too often it lets its neighbours get away with their violations. If things don't change, the Kurdish people will continue to be expendable pawns in West Asian politics. Now let's turn to Germany, Europe's wealthiest nation, a country known for its economic heft, but now a country staring at an economic crisis. Last year's report is out. The numbers have been crunched and it doesn't look good for Germany. The economy has contracted by 0.3%. It means the GDP has fallen over the last year. And the bad news does not end there. Reports say that this year things may not improve. 2024 could be another recession year for Germany, making it back-to-back -back years of negative growth for the first time since 2002-2003. In other words, these could be the worst years for the German economy in more than two decades. So how did this, how did it come to this? How did Europe's growth engine fail? Well, first, let's give the excuses. Germany had already been struggling since the Wuhan virus pandemic, we all were, but the effects lingered in Germany, almost like a case of long COVID. The global supply chains that were broken had not yet healed when another crisis erupted, the war in Ukraine, and Germany was particularly affected because of its dependence on Russia for oil and natural gas. Before the war broke out, Germany imported over half of its gas and over a third of its oil from Russia. These cheap Russian fossil fuels were helping drive German growth. But after the war started, the Russian taps were shut and Germany had to scramble for fuel. Around this time last year, Germany declared that it was no longer dependent on Russia. It had found alternatives from around the world. But these were never going to be cheaper than the Russian imports. You see, Russia and Germany had direct fuel pipelines, the Nord Streams. They directly linked Russia to Germany. Whatever Germany imports now will cost more than that arrangement. And that means Germans have to pay more, all Germans. Therefore, you have energy inflation, a cost of living crisis, and Germans trying to save more and consume less. And all of it reflects in the data. Last year, household consumption in Germany went down by 0.7%. And it wasn't just households tightening their purse strings. The German government took a, took a cut back too. Government expenditure fell by 1.7%. And all this is reflected in Germany's falling GDP. It's a, it's a domino effect. And it won't, won't end here. The next domino is already tumbling, as shown by the ongoing farmer and rail protest. Their fuel subsidies have been cut. So German farmers are protesting. They say growing crops is now unsustainable. But the government is not budging. I can't promise you more state aid from the federal budget today, but we can fight together for you to enjoy more freedom and respect for your work. That was the finance minister speaking, but the protesters and the farmers were in no mood to listen. They were heard booing and jeering. But the minister cannot promise aid when the state coffers are running dry. That's why the government has cut spending by 1.7%. And why they're trying to cut the subsidy for farmers. Now you may wonder, why doesn't the German government just borrow some money? Countries like the US seem to do it all the time. So why doesn't Germany follow suit? Well, because the German government cannot do it. They are constitutionally prohibited from borrowing beyond a point. They have a law known as the debt break. And this law stops both the central and state governments from taking extra loans. It's the only big economy with such a stringent borrowing limit and that's partially why it was the worst performing big economy last year. Unlike everyone else, Germany cannot bail itself out of trouble. So these were Germany's excuses for the poor economic performance in 2023. They may convince some people, but they're not working on German farmers or railway staff, and they're really not working for, for Germany's image. The country has been known for, its, for one thing over the last few decades, and that's economic growth. It's been Europe's leading light, its biggest economy, its growth engine. After World War II, Germany focused on economic recovery. Despite losing the war, it was given help. It received funds from the U.S. as part of a stimulus package. You may have heard of the Marshall Plan, that's what it was. And it helped Germany recover. 
The old war machine turned into a growth machine. But now the same Germany seems to be economically battered again and with no new Marshall Plan in sight. It is regaining its old reputation. The sick man of Europe. The question is, will someone step in to save the sick man or will it spend the next few years coughing, wheezing and struggling to recover? For our next story, I have a question. Have you been to a toy store recently? Think about the last toy you bought. It could be anything really, a stuffed toy, a remote controlled car, a doll, an action figure, a board game, anything. Did you see where that toy was made? Chances are it was made in China, most toys are. But have you ever wondered why? Why does China have a monopoly on toy manufacturing? After all, most toys are not complicated, not like electronic gadgets. So they should be easier to make. Plus, there's a huge market for toys. So surely, there are more manufacturers in the world. But for some reason, most of the toys we buy come from China. And this is set to change because toy makers are looking for a shift now. I'm talking about big names like Hasbro and Mattel. Hasbro is famous for its Monopoly board game. Mattel makes the Barbie doll. They make some of their toys in India. Now they want to expand. So what's holding them back? To understand that, we must understand the business of toys. Manufacturing is dominated by China. It is the biggest toy maker in the world. More than 70%, 70% 70 of the world's toys are made in China. And what is China's share in exports? 56%. So more than half of the toys made in China are sent overseas, mostly to the West. Let me show you some more numbers. These are from 2023, from January to September. We'll start with the US. 79% of toys sold in America were Chinese. It's as if the rest of the world just stopped making toys. All the manufacturing went to China. The reasons are well known. China was cheap. It had a large capacity. So factories could churn out more toys in less time. But the pandemic changed this. In 2020, when Chinese factories went offline because of the Wuhan virus, the toy makers struggled. China became less appealing for them. And they already had issues with Chinese toys, like poor quality. In fact, in 2007, there was a scandal. Mattel recalled 19 million toys. They were tainted with lead. We're talking about dolls, action figures, and cars. In 2018, Hasbro had a realization, their annual report said this, that the company was too dependent on China. They called it an operational risk. So toy companies were looking to move. The pandemic play proved to be a catalyst. That's when they actively started looking for alternatives and India emerged as a good option. The reasons are obvious. India has a large working population, stable government policies and connectivity with key markets. Plus, India has a unique advantage, the cost of labor. It is cheaper than China. Let me show you a comparison of salaries. In China, factory workers are paid between $198 to $376 a month. In India, it's between $108 and $180 a month. Global companies find it appealing. So they reached out to India. Last year, 82 companies showed interest. But the progress has been slow, and the biggest roadblock is capacity. India doesn't have enough factories. Going by one claim, there are just, just about 4,000 production units today. Say a company wants to move manufacturing to India, it can take two routes. Find a contractor or build its own factory. Now, using a contractor is simpler, but it can take up to 18 months for a company to find one. What about building your factory? It could take up to three years. So either way, you need more than one year to start making toys in India, and these timelines need to be shorter. That's the first challenge. The second roadblock is infrastructure. Companies need warehouses and last mile connectivity. India has been trying to solve these problems by building domestic manufacturing capacity and creating incentives. India made the first move in 2020. Import duties on toys were raised. Earlier it used to be 20%, now it is 70%. So importing toys in India makes little sense now. There is a 70% import duty. Second, India is setting up multiple production clusters. In 2021, eight of them were approved. 
in five states, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Uttar Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Here, toy makers are getting subsidies in the form of rent concessions, power tariffs and freight subsidy. So the market is witnessing a turnaround. From 2016 to 2020, China accounted for 86% of India's toy imports, 86%. By 2023, toy imports fell by 53%. And toy exports from India jumped by 239%. So there are more Indian toys in the market. The next step is to take them overseas. Do you know what is the current global share of Indian toys? Just 1%. But we say India is well placed to change that. Since we're on the subject of challenges, in India, taking a flight is now a game of chance. Expect delays, cancellations, maybe even a dinner on the tarmac. Fog in North India is what triggered this chaos, but airlines have not made things better. The way they've handled it, the way they've treated passengers, leaves a lot to be desired. So now India's aviation body has stepped in. That's the DGCA, the Directorate General of Civil Aviation. They've issued new guidelines for airlines. And what do they say? Ensure proper communication, offer adequate facilities, and if you anticipate a delay of more than three hours, consider cancelling the flight. Our next report tells you what to expect the next time you take a flight. Cancelled flights. Long waiting times. Crowded airports. Frustrated passengers. And rising tempers. Air travel was meant to be simple and fast. But right now, in India, it's a game of chance. If you're lucky, your flight may take off on time. If you're unlucky, you could be dining on the tarmac. The reason for this chaos is fog. A thick blanket has enveloped northern India and it resulted in a domino effect. It's affected flights across India. Take the Delhi airport for example. Yesterday, 500 were delayed. 87 flights were cancelled. Some of those delays even ran up to 13 hours. That's more than half a day. So now, the DGCA has jumped in. That's the Directorate General of Civil Aviation essentially India's aviation authorities. It has issued new protocols for flights to navigate the fog-related delays and cancellations. So here are the new SOPs. Airlines must share real-time information. Any flight delay information must be on their websites. All affected passengers must be informed through WhatsApp and email. Staff at airports should be sensitized. They must communicate with the passengers. Facilities must be provided to passengers. And if a flight is delayed over three hours, the airline may cancel it. That's the advice of the DGCA. This is to avoid overcrowding at airports and reduce inconvenience for passengers. But even then, passengers must be informed well in advance. So that's for airlines. But the aviation authority had a message for passengers too. Delays may be frustrating, but it's not an excuse for violence. And the DGCA made that very clear. Any unruly behavior is unacceptable and will be dealt with strongly. So while tempers may run high, don't let your hands run wild. Like this irate gentleman. So those are the SOPs. They are meant to ease the travel chaos. But will it bring relief? Well, it's unlikely any time soon. Fog is an annual occurrence in northern India. Today is the third day of dense fog in the national capital region. And according to weather officials, it's likely to continue till the end of the week. The Delhi airport is equipped with anti-fog landing systems. But only one runway with that technology is operating. The other one is under maintenance. The Delhi airport has been asked to expedite the process. Plus, there are grounded aircraft and parking shortages. All of that has contributed to this mess. After all, this is one of India's busiest airports we're talking about. 
so if you have a flight in the coming few days, make sure to check if it's on time. And don't lose heart or your cool if it isn't. India's aviation sector is going through some turbulence, and the fog over it is unlikely to lift until next week. Who's winning the new scramble for Africa? Well, China is in pole position, but this race has a dark horse, a country you wouldn't expect to do well. And that's Turkey. Let's look at some numbers first. Turkish firms have completed more than 1,800 projects in Africa, 1,800. Total cost, around $85 billion. They also employ a lot of people. Reports say around 100,000 Africans. Trade is also booming. In 2003, bilateral trade was just $5.4 billion. In 2022, it reached $41 billion, and chances are it hit $50 billion last year. This growth is not random. It's part of Turkey's long-term strategy. They have actively focused in Africa. Again, let's look at more numbers. In 2002, Turkey had just 12 embassies in Africa. Two decades later, they have 44. So what's the game plan here? What does Ankara want from Africa? what everyone wants, political support and business. In the last century, Turkey was not as interested in Africa. Their focus was on the West, on joining the European community. But in 1997, they got a reality check. Ankara was denied full membership of the European Union, so time was ticking. Turkey needed to diversify its foreign policy. In 1998, a new plan was unveiled. The Action Plan for Africa. It was later taken forward by Recep Tayyip Erdogan, first as Prime Minister, then as President of his country. He's taken personal interest in this relationship with Africa. Guess how many times he's visited Africa? 40 times in 20 years. More than any other world leader. In 2005, Tur Turkey declared the Year of Africa. Think of it as a grand PR exercise. That year, Erdogan visited Ethiopia and South Africa. He announced multiple projects. Others were late to the party. China declared the Year of Africa one year later. France did so five years later. So Turkey really set the trend. And what did they get in return? Political support. Turkey got observer status at the African Union. It was also declared a strategic partner in 2008, but the big victory came at the United Nations. Turkey was eyeing a temporary seat at the Security Council, and in 2010, they got it. How? Because African nations supported them. It's been a hybrid strategy. You can see Turkish cultural centers, hospitals, and schools in Africa. You can also see Turkish military bases in Libya and Somalia. Erdogan has struck security agreements with 30 African nations. Each agreement is different. Some allow Turkey to train African soldiers, others permit Turkish deployments. Either way, it's a win for Ankara. And looks like that will be Erdogan's pitch. That of a defense equipment provider. Of course, drones are on top of this list. Turkey has sold its Bayraktar TB2 drones to 10 African nations, like Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali. All three are battling terror groups. Turkish drones could give them an edge. Some African countries have already used the TB2, like Ethiopia and Togo. So going forward, drone diplomacy could be Erdogan's focus. Also, Islamic diplomacy. Some 27% of Africa's population is Muslim, and Erdogan loves to flaunt his religious credentials. The biggest example of that is Ghana. A massive blue mosque was inaugurated back in 2021. It was fully funded by Turkey. So it's clear why Erdogan wants Africa, a big market for his drones, support of the United Nations, also fertile ground to further his Islamist agenda. But what's in it for Africa? Well, too many options is never a bad thing. Plus, Ankara comes with less baggage. Turkey was not a colonial power in most of Africa. It also doesn't care about democracy. The US or Europe may not sell weapons to a military regime, but Erdogan will do so happily. No criticism, no judgments. What's impressive, though, is his secrecy. Everyone knows what China is doing in Africa. They also know about Russian and American designs. But Turkey has sort of slipped under the radar. Maybe that's how Erdogan wants it. After all, you cannot combat what you don't know. Where do you find the best stories? 
You may think movies or books, but sometimes the best stories are in real life, especially in the world of sports. It's a strange intersection of talent, hard work, and luck. Today, an Indian tennis player has proved that. His name is Sumit Nagal, a 26-year-old from India's Haryana state. Sumit Nagal has reached the second round of the Australian Open, and he did so by creating history. Nagal's opponent was Alexander Bublik. He was seeded 31 at the Australian Open. Now, seeding is just like ranking. Every Grand Slam picks the top 32 players. The idea is to make sure that they do not play each other in early rounds. In Australia, Novak Djokovic is number one seed. Bublik was seeded 31. And Sumit Nagal? He is unseeded. His ATP ranking is around 122. ATP is the Association of Tennis Professionals. They rank players. And Nagal's rank is 122. So many people, not many people in fact, gave him a chance. Very few Indians have defeated a seeded player at the Grand Slams. The last instance was way back in 1989. Ramesh Krishnan defeated a seeded opponent at the Australian Open. So history was tagged against him. But Nagal won. He beat his opponent in straight sets, and his performance was clinical. Nagal stuck to his strengths and waited for his opponent to make mistakes. The strategy worked. He took the lead and never gave it away. But let's not get too technical, because this is not just about one match. It's about the journey of this young man. Last year, Sumit Nagal was in a bad place. He was coping with multiple injuries. He had spent a lot of time outside the top 500 ranking. And he was running out of money. Nagal had just about 900 euros in the bank, which is around 80,000 Indian rupees. So he considered leaving tennis. From there to now, it's been a great journey. Sumit Nagal is through to the second round. His next opponent is ranked below him. So chances are he could win again. But even if he doesn't, he will walk away with a big prize, around 180,000 Australian dollars, which is 98 lakh Indian rupees. Talk about a coincidence. Last year, Nagal said he would need one crore rupees to break into the top 100. Today, he's almost there, 98 lakhs. So congratulations to him. Also, good luck for the next match. Now let's look at the larger picture. Can everyone be a Sumit Nagal? More importantly, why should they? Why can't we identify and help talent like him? Why should they have to struggle so much? To understand why, we need to take a closer look at tennis. It's a very expensive sport. A beginner racket costs around 4,000 rupees. Three tennis balls cost 400 rupees. Good coaches can charge up to 25,000. How many Indian families can afford that? Not many. Tennis is not like cricket or football. You can't just play the game anywhere. It requires a lot of training, equipment, and infrastructure. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the lack of a pipeline. With cricket, you have the Indian Cricket Board, the BCCI. They organize multiple regional level competitions. They identify talented players. Then they invest in them. That's not the case in tennis. Most Indian tennis stars have trained abroad, like Yuki Bamri, Rajnesh, Ram Kumar, even Sumit Nagal. India doesn't have the best coaches or facilities or even tournaments. India hosts just three or four challenger tournaments. The rest are mostly in Europe. So players must find the money, travel to Europe, stay there and then play. If not, you will lose out in the rankings. If you get sponsors, great. But in Indian tennis, that's tough. How many of you can name five Indian singles players? Chances are very few. So sponsors are also not keen. But is there a solution? Well, badminton could offer some clues. It's almost the same story as tennis. Not much state support, not a lot of money involved. But Indian badminton players are doing very well, mostly thanks to one man, Pulela Gopichan. His academy is churning out champions. Some say Indian tennis needs someone like that, someone who can create a pipeline. Could that be the solution to India's tennis woes? I'm afraid we don't have the answer, but we will say this. Sporting glory doesn't come easy, but when it does, the whole country benefits. Like Serbia and Novak Djokovic. He basically put the country on the map for a lot of people. India too must be able to do that. We have the talent, we have the audience as well. What we need is a better system in place.
In the United States, the verdict is clear. It is still Donald Trump's Republican Party. The people of the state of Iowa woke up to temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees, but it did not stop them from stepping out and declaring their support for Donald Trump. It was the first race of the election year. Republicans are choosing their presidential candidate, and Iowa shows that the choice is clear. It is Donald Trump, although not without surprises. Like Vivek Ramaswamy is dropping out, the Indian origin billionaire, he was making a lot of waves at the start of the campaign, but it did not translate into votes. So he's dropped out of the race. But if Trump wins, can Vivek Ramaswamy be the vice president? Our next report tells you. In 2021, Donald Trump had seen everything. He was out of the White House. He was accused of instigating the Capitol riots. He had a dozen cases against him. Indictments were looming. Many in the Republican Party were ready to write him off, to move on from the Trump era of politics. But two years, 22 months and 25 days later, Donald Trump is back. The former president won the Iowa caucus, the first race of the election year. Republicans here voted to choose their presidential candidate and to no one's surprise, it was Trump. He comes from a business background. He's not a, uh, he's not a swamp creature like our previous presidents like the Bushes or or, uh, or Clinton or, or Obama. I support Donald Trump because in the very beginning, I've always kind of believed that this country does not need to be run by another politician. I think that the best candidate would be someone who knows how to run a business. White evangelicals, young voters, women, they all voted for Trump. He had over 50% of the total votes, the biggest margin for any Iowa caucus challenger. This isn't Lincoln's or Reagan's party anymore, it's Donald Trump's. I really think this is time now for everybody, our country, to come together. We want to come together, uh, whether it's Republican or Democrat or liberal or conservative, it would be so nice if we could come together and straighten out the world and straighten out the problems and straighten out all of the death and destruction that we're witnessing. So Trump won Iowa, but who lost? Technically, everyone else. His closest rival was Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. At third place was former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley. Iowa didn't just catapult Trump's campaign, but it also proved that he has no clear rival. Which brings us to Vivek Ramaswamy. He's an entrepreneur of Indian origin, a billionaire. He started the race strong, attracting Trump's MAGA crowd. But none of that translated into votes. He has now dropped out of the presidential race. And what's the first thing he did after that? Endorse Trump. As I've said since the beginning, there are two America First candidates in this race. And earlier tonight, I called Donald Trump to tell him that I congratulate him on his victory. And... Now, going forward, he will have my full endorsement for the presidency. And I think we're going to do the right thing for this country. Does that mean he's eyeing the vice president seat? Will Trump make him his running mate? According to Trump's campaign, it's a big no. Trump's top advisor has ruled it out. Also, the former president seems to have already chosen his number two, but refuses to reveal the name publicly. And as we talk about winners and losers, how can we not mention Joe Biden? After all, it's him that Trump is likely to face in November. And many believe that Biden is the night's big winner. The US president has made this election about democracy. And that campaign becomes easier with Trump on the other side. Will Biden win that battle though? We'll get to know in November. What are the three fondest words in the English language? To some, it is I love you. To others, it is dinner is served. But if most people were truthful, the answer would probably be salary increment letter. The three words that most people would love to hear, salary increment letter, because people believe more money would make them happier, that their lives would improve if they could climb the income ladder, even if it's just a few rungs, which is why increments are such a big deal. Asking for a raise at work is like asking someone to prom. People think about a raise ever so often. But asking for one makes them nervous. Yet people continue to believe that once they do get it, their lives would, be, would change for the better. 
that they would be happier. And new studies agree, but only to an extent, because when the race comes, the reality is far from expectations, and I'll tell you why. But first, let me clarify one thing. Contrary to the adage, money does buy you happiness. Many studies have found the link between income and happiness. More money does not solve all problems, but maybe it is nicer to cry in a Ferrari. According to research, people's happiness increases with a rise in their salaries, up to at least half a million dollars. This applies to random lotteries as well. In one study, a cash giveaway of $10,000 boosted people's happiness for six months. In another, those who won six-figure lotteries were happier for a decade. On average, richer people tend to be happier, and this is obvious. More money means a higher standard of living and greater opportunities, which is why getting a raise is important, but its impact may not be as big as you would imagine. The magnitude of its effect is not life-changing, and there are three reasons why. For starters, the proportion of increase matters. Double the salary does not mean double the happiness, and a jump this big, double the salary, is rare. Usually the increase is incremental and small, so getting a raise does not really change people's day-to-day -day life. Secondly, as people move up the income scale, it takes more money to generate the same good feelings. This is what research says. Moving from fifteen to thirty thousand dollars has the same satisfaction as going from sixty to one twenty thousand dollars. And thirdly, it can be less about how much you make and more about how much others do. Basic human nature, comparison affects how happy people are with their pay, be it in companies or close to home. According to studies, executives are more likely to quit if their pay is low compared to the other top bosses. And living in an area where people make more money is linked to being less happy. So money is good, and a raise may temporarily make you happy. But it's one of the many facets of work life that would make you happy. And when it comes to income happiness, there is only one scientifically proven trick, time over money. People are happier when they focus on how they use the money rather than getting more of it. Think about it like this. A raise is for humans what GDP growth is for nations. It is a big priority. Now here is a list of the five biggest economies in the world, and then a list of the five happiest nations. This data is from last year, before a certain war broke out. But keeping that aside, we know that there is no overlap in the lists. There is a strong relationship between GDP and population well-being, but it starts breaking down after a certain level. Because growth for the sake of growth, just like a raise for the sake of it, does not always translate into happiness. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Do you hate folding your clothes? Well, Elon Musk's Optimus robot can do it for you. In Brazil, a city is underwater after torrential rain, and bad weather proves to be no match for US football fans. They trudge through snow and shovel it off the stands to catch an NFL game. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1991, the first Gulf War broke out. American fighter jets pounded Iraq after Saddam Hussein decided to invade neighboring Kuwait. The air raids were followed by a ground operation, coalition troops successfully drove Iraqi forces out of Kuwait. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
bikes or something out there in those piles. That'd be fun. Oh, absolutely. 